So our next uh, presenter is uh, Ben Greedy. He's a data scientist with the uh, city of Edmonton. They've been doing some really cool stuff. And uh, today he's going to sh uh, share some stuff about their inspection efficiencies. So take it away, Ben. Cool. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, also thank you for the delicious butter chicken wrap thing at the start. Delicious. Um, so yeah, I'm delighted to be here to talk, to talk today about this project that we've uh, just rolled out in October called the Safety Code Inspection Efficiencies Project. Um, this project's about using uh, machine learning to improve um, a pr the process of conducting um, building safety code inspections uh, that are done by the city of Edmonton. Should I just, I can just press that if you like. Sure. All right. <laughs> um, no problem. Um, so I'm going to, so first of all, I, there's at least a few people um, I recognize that have seen my dog and pony show before. So uh, hopefully there's a little bit of new material in there um, for, for you people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the business case um, that's driving this, um, the model itself, and then I'm going to um, spend quite a bit of time talking about um, communication and risk, and so I'll, I'll get into more of that um, later, and then finally I'll touch on um, how we deployed this. Um, and what's pretty exciting is that um, we, just receive, we, we just received notification that we're going to get a Smart 50 award for this, which is um, probably more a statement on how behind the times municipalities are um, than what we've done. But it's nice to get um, the recognition um, that we're kind of leading the way in at least some respect. Um, so the business case. Um, so so I'm, I'm, as a data scientist, I sit in a different department from um, the department that does um, safety codes inspections. Um, and so there's in an organization as big as the city of Edmonton, there's quite a bit of um, weaving around to, to find um, the, the best business problems to apply um, data science to. But we came to this business area um, as a business area that has um, basically um, the, the, the assets that they have in terms of the people that can go and inspect buildings are not well matched to the risk um, associated with the buildings that they're inspecting. And so we wanted to use data science um, and the data that they've been collecting over a number of years to rectify that and basically match the resources to the size of the risk. Um, the business area is fairly complex. Um, these, these bubbles um, are, all represent a type of inspection that takes place for a single family house. Um, the city of Edmonton do every single inspection that is possible to do on every single house. Um, and that's a pretty hefty cost to the taxpayer. Um, but however, we're, we're not mandated to do that many inspections. So um, everything in blue is mandatory and we'll never, we'll never touch that stuff. Um, everything in green is actually completely discretionary and everything in orange is choose one off. But right now, the city, or up until recently, the city of Edmonton have inspected everything. Um, so we wanted to identify amongst the orange and the green inspections uh, which ones were low risk on an inspection by inspection basis in order to um, potentially drop those inspections and um, have the inspectors spend more time on other inspection types that are higher risk. Um, and for context, other municipalities in Alberta do none of the ones in green and the minimum for the orange. So this is kind of moving us in that direction, but taking into account risk. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the model. Um, I'll zip through this fairly quickly because the model isn't really um, kind of where the challenge of this project um, came up so much, um, which sounds weird, but I'll explain more. Um, so first of all, the data inputs. Um, it's 600,000 historical inspections. Every inspection was one row in our data set. We have a bunch of predictive variables to, um, that we're using to try to predict whether an inspection would pass at the first attempt or not. Um, so that's what we're trying to predict. Um, the types of predictive variables that we used were um, various attributes about the building, various uh, geographical um, sort of attributes. Um, 
facts about the contractors, builders, and um, homeowners. So, like, how well have they done in the last 12 months and three months in terms of the fraction of inspections they've passed at the first attempt? And finally, um, uh, some attributes about the inspection itself. Um, and by the way, this is a great area, and I'm going to talk about this a couple of places in, in, in this. Um, this is a great area that um, a business and a data scientist can interact. And, um, you know, we, as, as a data scientist, you can come out of your little cave and actually communicate with the business about um, which attributes they think would be important. Um, and you can learn a lot from the business, uh, from the business itself. Um, so training the model, um, this is a fairly uh, cookie cutter way of doing things. Um, we take our 300, uh, sorry, 600,000 um, inspections um, and we know the answer for those because they're historical data. We train a model um, and we take that, um, that trained predictive model and apply it. Um, so we partitioned, we did all the, all the usual things, so I'm just kind of flying over this. We, tra we partitioned into training and test and we did cross-validation. And um, kind of key here is we withheld actually 50% of the historical data because we, at, as we roll out the project, we need, to, um, we need to make sure we're measuring how well the model is working and have data to retrain the model down the line. And so as we were testing it for historical data, we wanted to make sure that we, our scenario was realistic for what we would be doing in the future. Um, and then making predictions, we, take, we kind of forklift that trained model, um, input new inspections with all of the same attributes, and uh, we take into account um, the, the quality management plan, that, that kind of diagram of um, which inspections have to be done. And we come to basically either dropping the inspection or keeping the inspection because the model is not certain enough, keeping the inspection because we need to audit it, or keeping the inspection because it's mandated in like a choose one of two or, um, yeah. Um, and then just to layer on top of this, um, we, we actually tested it um, in three year chunks where we took two years of training and applied it to the subsequent year. And we did that back in time for 10 years worth of data. So we were able to kind of look back in the historical data and see what would have happened you know, in 2008 if we hadn't known um, any, of the historic, any of the inspections um, past 2007. So we kind of really went through and tested what would have happened, um, which, which helped us um, around setting up the model um, in the right way to account for the business's appetite for risk. So this next part um, is about how we communicated the model um, parts of the model to the business and sort of balance that reward versus risk. Um, so this was probably 80 or 90 percent of the project was actually um, educating the business, talking to the business, having them look at historical inspections, basically false positives. Um, so um, and, and the kind of key part of the model here is um, once you have a trained, um, a trained classification model, like the one we're using, um, rather than just getting the pass versus fail out of the model, um, you actually get a score between zero and one about how, um, how certain the model is that the inspection would pass at the first attempt. And then you can threshold the model. And depending on where you threshold it, you basically change that risk reward trade-off and this is what we needed to um, kind of educate the business on. So I'm just going to show you a couple of slides because I think it, to, to me it was the most challenging part of the project was figuring out how to communicate this to the business. So we tried to make it really visual. So, um, so here I kind of, to go through um, introducing the confusion matrix, first I said, okay, each one of these dots represents an inspection. Um, and all of the ones on the left-hand side are inspections that passed. All of the ones on the right-hand side are inspections that would have actually failed. And then our model comes and decides that a whole bunch of them are going to pass at the first attempt. Um, the, model, the, the model predictions for the, model, for, for the inspection passing are um, the ones inside that circle. And so, you know, within the circle you have true positives, two thumbs up, good news. 
Um, false positives, which are the big like thumbs down, we don't we want to minimise those, and then you know um, false negatives and true positives, which are less um, less important in in, in this case. Um, and so the key part that we wanted to convey to the business was that as we change the threshold um, of the model, that circle becomes bigger or smaller, and the reward, i.e. the number of inspections that are dropped is balanced against the number of false positives that you get. Um, and so this kind of transitioned over to a confusion matrix. So the colors hopefully match up there. Um, so this is something, so this is the way we kind of made the non-technical business people understand the concept of, you know, false positives in the top right there, true positives in the top left, etc. And this is how we kind of showed them um, and, and we, we, we had some more complex plots that I'm not throwing up right now, um, but basically as we change the thresholding of the model, how things, uh, how inspections migrate um, from, you know, the bottom row to the top row, but the proportion of, um, of true positives versus false positives changes. Um, and we also use this kind of uh, visual stuff to, um, to show them um, some kind of the key metrics that they need to understand. So precision, um, fraction of dropped inspections that were correct. So visually, that kind of looks like the top row. Um, you know, what is it? True positive divided by condition positive. Um, and specificity um, or recall, if you do it the other way around, um, which is the fraction of deficiencies, and that's covered up right now, but the fraction of deficiencies that we detect. And this all sort of culminated. So once they understood this, um, and I'm kind of missing, um, or th this is um, a few months worth of a working group with industry representatives and frontline inspectors, um, and et cetera, et cetera, um, understanding this. But it all came down to this risk reward trade off. So, um, so basically, um, on the horizontal axis here, we have the um, fraction of deficiencies that we would detect, i.e. the specificity, versus the number of inspections on average per year that we could drop. Um, and so depending on where they wanted to land in terms of the specificity, um, it would basically change the number of inspections that we would be able to drop each, each year. Um, so finally, I'll move on to just a couple of words about deployment. Um, so this is the other big daunting part of the project, um, more than training the model, this was um, fairly difficult. So um, basically, bottom right here, um, we have a huge um, enterprise management system. It's like a behemoth, kind of um, very difficult to go and make complex changes in. And so we wanted to minimize um, the impact of, of um, this whole project on, on, the big, the, on the big moving container ship. Um, so we created a REST API behind which our model was, um, was uh, running. And then to just make things as smooth as possible and to minimize the interface between um, the EMS enterprise management system and our model, um, we actually ran the model nightly on the upcoming inspections, which meant that all this EMS had to do was send a process ID over to the REST API and it got its result back rather than having to send all of those like 15 or 20 attributes. So it's kind of like we set up the whole thing that we looked after as much complexity as possible over um, in the top left, where we're working in R and Python, and we have a much more flexible sort of system and um, minimize the impact on the big container ship. Um, and finally, we. Uh, we, we built a, um, a shiny dashboard um, in R, which shows basically the, um, the impact of the, of, of the program. Um, it, it started in October, and so far, um, 500 and something inspections have been dropped. Um, we're anticipating annually it will be between 1,000 and 2,000. Um, and there's a, few, there's a few like alarm bells that will start going off. Things will start going red if, if um, if our specificity or our model precision goes out of whack. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's it, basically. Um, so, yeah, launched in October. 
I've already said all this. Um, I, I really appreciate everybody listening and be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question. So, from the moment that you deploy this model, you are expected to um, inspect properties that are predicted to pass, but that might bias the data for the future. Yeah, that's. Uh, it, yeah. So my question is, <laughs> how, how well, have you considered to do like to fix that, or like, how is how is that going to be? Like because the, the machine learning algorithm is going to be learning from a bias sample, isn't it? Yep, so that is a great question. Um, and that is why we reserve, that's why we reserve actually 50% of the inspections, even, even the model said to drop, we go and inspect them anyway. So, so that hits two birds with one stone. One is um, it mostly takes care of the inspections that are, um, that are like choose one of. Um, and it also, um, because we randomly choose those inspections for auditing before we make the model prediction, um, we know it's a representative sample. So it's completely random before the model even steps in. We know behind the scenes whether we're going to um, go and do that inspection even though the model said to drop it. Um, and the second, the second point I'd make, uh, we were very worried about... Um, and th this is a bit of a sidetrack, but we're very worried about people trying to game the system. So um, if somebody gets notified that their inspection is not required, um, that they, for example, um, don't put as much building material like um, gravel or something into a, in, into a, a basement or you know, so, something like that. Um, and so we went to pretty, um, pretty far lengths in terms of um, the process at the business process that um, the person only gets notified the morning of if the inspection is going to be dropped. So it's booked as if it's going to happen, so they have to be prepared for it to happen. If they go and cancel the inspection at the last minute, then that inspection is no longer um, able to be dropped. So. Excellent. Amy on this side, question? Yeah. Okay. Why do you need to run this model all the time? I'm not. Why Why do you need to run this model all the time? Because your your history doesn't change much from day to day. Yeah, great, great question. So, um, so there's so there's two things. Um, first of all, um, th there's the mo the model making predictions um, sort of every night um, is for upcoming inspections. So. Um, so so you know somebody will be building a new house. Um, there, that that house will be in our system with all of the attributes needed for the model. And once they, when they come to book their inspections, it will um, go to the model and it will make its prediction. Um, so so it needs to be running in order to catch those new, to, to make predictions on those new inspections. So that's number one. Number two, um, we've actually found, and I didn't really mention this in in the talk, but. Um, we found that over time, things like um, safety code standards have changed over time, like the rule book has changed. Um, contractors come and go, and their quality changes. And so um, we, we're actually updating the model, retraining the model every quarter on the past two years of data. So we want to make sure that the model is uh, fresh all the time and kind of based upon the most relevant data. Good question. Thanks for your presentation. This is great. Um, question for you: um, What's the evaluation plan like? How do you know if saving inspections actually is useful? I know for the ne the now term, saving inspections saves you money, but you know inspections are there so that home warranty issues don't happen, catastrophic failures don't happen. How far in the future? Do you have to look t to say this uh, this process was uh, overall useful? Yeah, so that's a great question as well. Um, so, so the first the first part is that we um, we we actually worked on this um, in a working group where we had um, about half a dozen um, 
people from industry come in. Um, we had um, a couple of people from the Home Builders Association, then we had um, City of Edmonton mm. building inspectors, um, all in the same room. And those questions were, were asked. And um, so what we came to was, um, so first of all, um, this isn't saving money at this point. Um, it's reprioritizing inspectors um, to be able to um, more efficiently get to the backlog of inspections. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two, um, it's, it's allowing them to get to the more, um, the, the more risky inspections. And bear in mind, um, the inspection types that are eligible to be dropped are like the, the province has said, you don't have to do these. Um, these are optional. They're either choose one of or they're completely optional. Um, and other municipalities um, just don't do them blanket across the board. Um, so so th that, that's the kind of uh, reasoning. Now the third point, um, we, we wanted to make sure that it really was the lowest risk inspections that were being dropped. And so um, those industry representatives along with our um, frontline inspectors went through, I'm gonna say thousands, um, either high hundreds or low thousands of individual inspections for which the model had been run at various thresholds and they looked um, really long and hard at the false positives and dug into um, the problems that were underlying those, um, those failures. And they had like this five point risk register um, that they evaluated them on. So we looked across um, you know, hundreds of inspections and what we found was um, almost all of the failures were, um, were ones or twos and there was about a couple of threes, but nothing got into the um, like health safety um, part of the spectrum. So. Yeah. Well, in your, your presentation, you might look at um, explaining how the inspections are redistributed by risk because your final outcome was you said 500 inspections were saved. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a different metric. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I appreciate that. That's a good, uh, a good point. Right, one more question. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. So uh, I hear that you uh, try to improve your model by uh, train your uh, uh, algorithm with your data, right? I think it's a good idea that you uh, collaborate, like for example, city of Calgary, city of uh, uh, Vancouver. So because when you have more data, you have much better um, uh, estimation for your model, right? Thank you. So I, I, I struggled to hear a little bit, but was was the question whether we should? Yeah, uh, if you have more uh, data from another city, so it's very good for your train, train like for learning for your model, right? Yeah, so that that's actually a, a great point. Like the the more the more data we have, the more relevant data we have, the better. And I don't doubt that that data would be relevant. The question to me would be whether we can line it up properly and have um, the same attributes that are needed to, um, to, to, to be able to run the model. Um, but yeah, um, if they were willing, to, if, if there was a consensus to share that data, which um, might be difficult in terms of FOIP and stuff like that, it, it, would, be, it would be great. <coughs> 